West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. For the second time in a week, a community is in mourning after another mass shooting in America. There's a makeshift memorial now that stands near the supermarket in Boulder, Colorado, where a gunman massacred 10 people. The suspect, 21-year-old Ahmed Alyssa, has been charged with 10 counts of first-degree murder. He was taken into custody after being shot by police and is in stable condition. I want to say to the community, I am so sorry this incident happened. And we are going to do everything in our power to make sure this suspect has a thorough trial and we do a thorough investigation. These are the 10 victims. They range in age from 20 to 65, each one with their own story, their own unique lives. Three of them were at work when the shooter arrived. The youngest victim, Denny Strong, Stong, had worked at the supermarket for several years. A year ago, he posted this image to his Facebook page, of course, as the pandemic was getting underway. I can't stay home. I'm a grocery store worker. Ricky Olds was a manager at the supermarket who loved cats and unicorns. Her aunt posting on social media today, why you, why not me? You haven't even lived yet. Terry Liker had worked at the King Supers for 30 years. Her boyfriend worked there, too. According to a friend, she was selfless, innocent, an amazing person who loved going to work and enjoyed everything about being there. Lana Bartkoviak had stopped at the shopping center just to pick up a prescription, just a daily routine kind of thing. She managed a shop in Boulder, and her friend said she would give clothing away to people who couldn't afford it. She lived with her chihuahua, Opal. She had just gotten engaged. Eric Talley, you may have heard about, he was the Boulder police officer who was the first, we understand, on the scene. He's got a fascinating backstory. He enrolled in police academy at age 40, leaving a stable career in IT. This officer had seven children, ages five to 18. I just had that officer's whole family in my office two weeks ago to give him an award. I can tell you that he's a very kind man and he didn't have to go into policing. He had a profession before this but he fell at a higher calling. Right now, uh, across the country, as millions of people get vaccinated against the virus, uh, it's impossible not to feel like we are beginning to return to some semblance of normal, some post-pandemic life. But this too, this feels like normal, an unbearable normal, an avoidable normal, an all too American normal. And just like they always do, Republican politicians are just waving it away, making excuses, for why they block basic gun safety measures at every turn. That's normal, too. It's also part of this awful ritual that we've all practiced now dozens of times. This afternoon, President Biden called on the Senate to pass two bills approved by the House that would close loopholes and background check laws. He also called for a ban on the kind of assault weapons often used in mass shootings, including the one in Boulder. 
This is not, it should not be a partisan issue. This is an American issue. It will save lives, American lives. And we have to act. Here's the thing. Gun sales in America are surging. Do you know there was a 40% increase last year? Nearly 40 million guns purchased legally in 2020, another 4 million in January of this year alone. Gun sales are higher than ever. You might think, with so many of us stuck inside for much of 2020, that gun deaths might have fallen. But in fact, no. It was one of the most violent years in decades, with shootings particularly spiking in city after city after city, even as in those same cities, many of the other crime numbers remained relatively steady. More than 19,000 people in the U.S. died from gun violence last year, according to the nonprofit Gun Violence Archive. That's a 25% increase from the previous year, and a new record. And that does not include suicides. A 2018 analysis shows that the U.S. has the highest number of civilian firearms per 100 residents by far. It's almost on its own chart. You see it up there at the top? That bar? You need a different scale for it, easily outpacing countries like Yemen. That's the chart there. That's what it looks like, American exceptionalism on this issue. As Vox notes, Americans make up less than 5% of the world's population, yet they own roughly 45% of the world's privately held firearms. This chart shows guns per 100 people and gun deaths per 100,000. You see that? All those countries on the lower left, those are countries with relatively few guns per 100 people, relatively few deaths. And then up at the top on the right, U.S., that's us with by far the most guns and the most gun deaths. It's just its own category. It's pretty clear we're just doing something different than anywhere else. The site of America's latest mass shooting, Boulder, Colorado, is a pretty liberal city, a college town. It's a great place if you've ever been. It's in a state, of course, that has had some of the worst mass shootings in the nation, some of the most traumatizing, some of the most awful, a movie theater in Aurora, or, of course, a high school in Columbine. And in fact, the Boulder City Council banned assault weapons for the city back in 2018, along with bump stocks and high-capacity magazines. And they did that partially in response to the mass shooting at Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, that year. But Colorado NRA affiliate and others sued to block the ban. And just 10 days before yesterday's mass murder, on March 12th, a judge blocked Boulder from enforcing that ban. And four days later, on March 16th, the suspect purchased a Ruger AR-556 pistol, according to the arrest affidavit. This is what that so-called pistol looks like, just so you don't get the wrong idea because of that name. That is what the gun looks like. It's familiar probably to you now. It's almost iconic in the demonic gun violence that we have here in this country. The same kind of assault weapon that was used in at least one other mass shooting and very similar to ones that have been used in shooting after shooting after shooting after shooting. And on the very same day, the subject, suspect purchased this weapon. This weapon. The National NRA celebrated the judge's decision to block Boulder's assault weapon ban, proclaiming NRA victory in Colorado and claiming the judge had given law-abiding gun owners something to celebrate. It is Wednesday, the 24th of March of 2021, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef, and our daily special is Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Oh, my. Well, uh, we're still resonating here with the mass shooting in Colorado coming on the heels of the one in Atlanta. And, of course, I think there was a half a dozen or more that happened. But we didn't hear about those. Because, as Chris Hayes uh, said at the top, it's a new normal. Or is it? It's not a new normal. It's just a normal. It's been a normal for a considerable time. Some people might say it's been a normal since Columbine. Some people might say it's a normal from before. Others might say it's a normal since Sandy Hook. Well, I did note that the response to Sandy Hook... Because I can, I'll just cut to the chase here. You know, one of my most vivid memories of Sandy Hook, the response to Sandy Hook, is... Really, I gotta say, almost the immediate response from gun nuts that we were not going to take their guns away. 
And then coming directly on the heels of that was a disinformation campaign that I got to tell you seemed uh, rather Vladian to me at the time. And that was before Vlad was uh, being bantied about or bandied about as being, well, you know, the, the killer that he is, at least on the mass level that we know now. But that disinformation campaign that Sandy Hook was a false flag operation done solely to take guns away from law-abiding American citizens. And then the just constant defenses of the shooter and his right to get a gun, because if he can't get a gun, that means they cannot get a gun. And here we are once again. The repugs, the gun nuts, the right wing, really pretty much uh, all of them together are on this same messaging. And I just want to know, what exactly is the reason they think that if guns are kept from crazy ass, violent, irrational asshats prone to delusions, that it means they won't be able to have a gun? What exactly are they saying? Well, we know exactly what they are saying. I just wish that they knew what they were saying. Or do they? Maybe they are more self-reflective than I've given them credit for. They recognize that they are prone to, delu to delusions. They recognize that they are violent extremists. They recognize that they are irrational asshats. Pretty much crazy ass irrational asshats. And they've come to terms with it. And the terms that they, that they have come to is that, well, <laughs> they need guns. Because no one's going to tell them what to do. How does a democracy survive in the midst of that? Is that freedom allowed? Any irrational, crazy-ass, violent asshat <laughs> gets a gun. But... 86-year-old grandmas who have voted in every election that they've been allowed to vote in won't be able to vote because they can't prove who they are. Well, that just shows, and I've mentioned this too on social media, that apparently elections, voting is more dangerous than mass shootings. 43 states are trying to stop voting. Show me 43 states trying to stop mass shootings. Uh, voting's got to be a lot more dangerous. Got to gotta rid of it. Get rid of it. Got to. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, we have a problem, Houston. <laughs> yes, we do. No one needs these Armalite rifles. No one does. No one needs an AK-47, whatever that is. Yeah, I know. Some people think that the AR-15 was a, was a, meant, you know, assault rifle. You called it an assault rifle. You don't know what guns are, so you can't ever talk about guns, so we, we get to have our guns and kill everything. <laughs> yeah, okay, right. Well, what about that well-regulated militia, okay? Why can't you define that to its proper, you know, definition? They never can. They don't want to be part of a well-regulated militia because regulated. We don't like regulations. I'll repeat it again. Just because you're between the ages of 15 and, what, 45? that doesn't automatically make you a member of the, of the National Guard. All right? And I got to tell you, a well-regulated militia also set, uh, set forth that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you stole your guns, your weaponry, at the armory. Oh, yeah, you might have been able to take your blunderbuss home. Okay? But a blunderbuss, not an Armalite rifle. 
No one gets to take grenades home from the armory when they've done their weekend stint with the National Guard. Please. And what's up with John Kennedy Pool? A pool of Confederacy of Dunces is where John Kennedy comes from in Louisiana. This this fool is putting on this corn pone shtick. He went to an Ivy League school. He knows exactly what he's doing. And it's craven and it's evil. But it's also stupid. Apparently, Ivy League educations don't go very far because, well, maybe for networking purposes. Critical thinking? I don't know. Because John Kennedy, the from the pool of the Confederacy of Dunces, not to be confused, please, with JFK. This idiot is out there proposing that and, and using driving laws as, as an example of how, uh, well, you know, we, we can't take people's guns away. No one takes away, uh, you know, uh, when, when, I don't know what he's talking about. Driving laws, you have to register your car. There's implied consent to even be on the roads, meaning that the cops can pull you over for a reasonable cause. Like swerving in your lane you might be drunk but nobody out there in the general public is going to lose their car because some random asshat prone to delusions failed the breathalyzer test and had their car taken away nobody else is going to have their car taken away granted there is third party liability if you were the bartender that served that drunk the drinks you were prone to prosecution as well. If that drunk-ass, crazy-ass uh, drunk prone to delusions runs over somebody, you can be charged as an accessory to that crime because you served them the drinks. And you're supposed to keep track on whether that inebriated person, well, you shouldn't be spending any more money. you got to cut them off. So, yeah, there's repercussions. How... I'm just mentioning it because gun shop owners were looking at you. You were going to sell a gun to a crazy ass asshat. How did I put it again? Pro irrational asshat. Violent irrational asshat. Prone to delusions. Every description of this fellow in Boulder. O Owali? Is that his Last name? I'll get it. Um, every description, all of his classmates, anybody came in contact with him, like, said that he would just, like, go off. Scream there, I'm going to kill everybody, or who's, somebody's following me. And they, they basically described a very sick person. Even his family, unfortunately, had to put up with it. Tried to calm him down. And yet this fellow was able to get a gun. Because if this fellow was un, was incapable of getting a gun, it means that the general Republican voter will not be able to get a gun. Which I guess means that they are crazy-ass, violent, irrational asshats prone to delusions. Hillary is a baby eater. John Podesta's risotto is part of the menu to eat babies in the basement of Comet Pizza. Joe Biden stole the election from Donald Trump. The Democrats, the liberals are going to take our guns from us this time. We're not taking your guns away. Yeah, I might joke about it. Saying we're not going to take everybody's guns away, just yours. No, we're talking about gun safety. Universal background check. If you think that you're not going to pass a universal background check, then maybe you should not be buying a gun. Sorry. We're not coming to take your guns, though I got to tell you, no civilian should have an Armalite rifle. No. Just like you're not allowed to have a grenade in your home or carrying it around I'm going to open carry a grenade to Walmart just to show everybody who is really the boss and that's really what it's all about 
They want to show who is the boss. Because that's what people who are prone to delusions do. Well, maybe not all of them. But there's a sizable block about, what, 71 to 74 million who think that way? All right. Like I said, we got a little bit of a problem here, Houston. The gas is leaking. The oxygen is leaking into the void of space. It's not really a void, but we used to call it that. Hey, enough of all of that. What's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Smothered Benedict Wednesdays, indeed. Well, Montana governor, remember that guy? Greg Gianforte? Yeah, the body slammer guy. Well, he received a warning from wildlife officials after killing a radio-collared wolf near Yellowstone National Park. That poor wolf wandered off the, off of the uh, the park. And now it's dead. And the governor of Montana did it. Gambling foes are concerned about financial deals between colleges and sports betting companies as if there's never been a problem with college sports and betting before. And the Rona Jaffe Award for Emerging Writers has been discontinued. And that is a tragedy. After the break, we move to the chef's table where two U.S. senators, and one of them is my senator, Mark Lee. Yes, hey there, Jeff pushed the leading solar energy lobbying group to clarify how much U.S. dependence on solar products is linked to forced labor in China. And the Philippine Supreme Court condemned the alarming number of killings of lawyers and judges. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. at netrootsradio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link right there by the social media scroll kelly lincoln monitors the chat room and so much more thank you kelly if you would then take a look across the page to the left near the bottom of our home page at netrootsradio.com uh, there is the link to our patreon page now if you could afford an espresso type coffee drink and send that those funds to us once a month through Patreon. Uh, your monthly contribution to this cause here allows us to pay our bills, fly under the radar, and continue Resistance Radio as the founders originally intended oh so many years ago. Yes, we are tooting our own horn this year because we're celebrating our 10th year of Resistance broadcast on this internet platform and we have you to thank for allowing us to fulfill our civic duty to be able to do that for 10 years now of course though the bulk of how we do it does come out of our own pockets we would still be unable to do it without you so thank you for your generosity and i can't tell you how important and well heartfelt it has been that some of you have actually increased your contribution your monthly uh patronage in this in these perilous times. Thank you. Bills keep going up. <laughs> I guess they do. Plus, you know, making sure we have the machinery also. We used to fight against this thing. I don't know if any of you kids have heard this term, but it was called planned obsolescence, meaning that you build things so they break down so people have to buy them again. We fought against that. We wanted things built so they would last, and now we're back to planned obsolescence again. And I don't know. <laughs> we just have to keep getting new software and machines, the actual machinery. And we've been able to do it because of your generosity, and we thank you so very much. 
If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, it is really simple. Go to at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. And a whole lot more. And both he and Kelly are pretty darn busy out there in real life. So thank you. If you would like to follow me on Twitter, in fact, I suggest you do. Because I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's. And then I post that up on Twitter at Justice Putnam about 10 minutes before showtime. And I also get it linked up on other social media platforms. And you know who they are. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. And please do pick up podcasts and review where you can. I don't know. Do I really want to review? <laughs> well, mark it somehow because that's how they do it. And you can find podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc. 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 All righty, let's get into this first offering and not think about reviews that might be uh uh hovering, hovering out there in the ether, just waiting to I don't know, latch on to us. Anyway, uh, the Associated Press brings us this first offering, and Matthew Brown is the journalist that penned this piece. Montana Governor Greg Gianforte received a warning from wildlife officials after killing a radio-collared wolf near Yellowstone National Park without first taking a mandated trapper education course, a violation of state hunting regulations. Officials said yesterday, Tuesday. So what's he going to do? He's going to like put the the inspector in a headlock and body slam him to the ground? I'm tired of your kind coming in here. Okay, maybe. Now, while it's legal to kill wolves in Montana with a license, trappers, he was going to trap a wolf. Trappers must first complete a three-hour online course that includes instruction on how to take the animals ethically and lawfully. Well, he probably figures since he's the governor, he already knows. Ethically and uh, uh, lawfully, he's the law. And his ethics are beyond reproach, apparently. And he's got the body-slamming abilities to prove it. Now, Gianforte had a valid wolf license... But uh, news of the governor's violations comes as lawmakers in Montana and Idaho have been considering proposals to make it much easier to kill wolves in a bid to drive down the predator's numbers. Giaforte could soon receive bills for possible signing into law that would allow unlimited hunting of wolves and payments for dead wolves akin to the bounties that exterminated them across the U.S. in the last century. Just weeks after taking office, Giaforte trapped and shot the male wolf on February 15th, about 10 miles north of the park, on a ranch owned by Robert E. Smith, director of the conservative Sinclair Broadcasting Group. Oh, Sinclair. Uh Uh-huh. They're just a little bit, I wouldn't even say to the left. I would say they're right there with Owen. In that, well, you know, they're disseminating Russian propaganda. Hi, Rob. How are you? And a Giaforte campaign donor. I guess they don't get to be named because it's dark money. Now, it was according to the Mountain West News Bureau, which first reported the violation. Officials determined Gianforte had broken the trapping certification rule a day later when the Republican governor brought the animal's remains to a state game warden in Helena to report the kill as regulations require. In situations like this, we use it as an education opportunity and issued a written warning, the wildlife and game officials said. Everything related to the harvest was done right. Oh, they harvested it. Yeah. They grow them, nurture them, feed them, and then they harvest them? Really? Now, Gianforte immediately rectified the mistake and enrolled in a wolf trapping certification course scheduled for Wednesday. Today, Gianforte spokesperson Brooke Strokey said, 
he was allowed to keep the animal's skull and hide because they got to display it on the wall. And they got to make a little rug so they can sit in, sit in front of it with their feet on it while they sit on their overstuffed leather chair. Yes, probably from anthropology. Gianforte has previously described himself as a lifetime member of the Montana Trappers Association. It was the first wolf he's killed. Well, the wolf was a... Six to seven year old male who had been born in Yellowstone National Park who was fitted with a radio collar to track its movements in 2018. The animal was a member of the park's Wapiti Lake and Eight Mile Packs, then went off on its own to find a mate. Perry of the AP brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. A national group that fights compulsive gambling is concerned about financial deals between colleges and sports betting companies. You know, I have a problem not just for compulsive gamblers, but just gambling, period, when it pits college sports or any sports. Why? Because of the subterfuge that members of the mob, for instance, uh, push on those athletes, coaches, and others to throw games, shave points. Just because gambling is legal doesn't mean illegal activity is now no longer taking place. Please. The National Council on Problem Gambling issued a set of recommendations for such deals that aim to reduce the danger of students developing a gambling problem. How about student-athletes getting pressured by mobsters to shave points? I'd like to see some protection for those college students. They include not compensating the schools based on the number of people the colleges refer to sign up for sports betting. What the hell? And they call on schools to provide problem gambling education and for sports betting companies to fund those efforts. How about sports betting companies can't bet on college sports? I'd like to not, I'd like to see them not betting on professional sports, but you gotta start somewhere or you gotta get back to it somehow. What was the Black Sox scandal all about? What about Boston College and their point-shaving scandals? Do I go on? Sports betting companies, including PointsBet and William Hill, have reached affiliation deals with colleges, including the University of Colorado and the University of Nevada's Las Vegas and Reno campuses. Well, that's because it's Nevada. Last September, Points Bat and the University of Colorado inked a $1.6 million five-year deal in which the school will receive funding while promoting the sports book on its media channels and at in-person sporting events. The deal also calls for Colorado to receive $30 for each person that signs up for sports betting after being referred to the school. In a news release when the deal was announced, Colorado said the partnership provides a financial boost for CU Athletics during a time when athletic department budgets nationwide are stressed by the COVID-19 pandemic. You have no idea how much these mobsters pay. Yeah, well, you know what? You'll be paying dearly if you don't perform the way they want you to perform.
Noel Atali of the AP brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A literary prize that provided vital support to Tracy K. Smith, Eula Biss, and more than 100 other women early in their writing careers has been discontinued. Administrators of the Rona Jaffe Writers Award cited significant costs in running the program founded in 1995. The Foundation's board feels that we can use these funds, resulting in even greater impact by supporting vital literary, educational, and cultural nonprofits that serve creative artists and the literary arts more comprehensively as their core missions, according to a recent post on the Jaffe's Foundation website. For the past quarter century, the Jaffe Foundation had annually awarded six or more women grants of up to $30,000 each to give them more time to write. The awards were established by Rona Jaffe, a novelist who died in 2005. Biss, known for her award-winning essay collection Notes from No Man's Land and other nonfiction, received a Jaffe grant in 2002. She called it a major turning point in her career that enabled her to break a cycle of part-time jobs and to focus on writing. It was not an exaggeration to say that the Jaffe Award changed my life. The fact that this award was specifically for emerging women writers made it particularly important, she told the AP. One of the 1995 recipients, poet Erin Ballou, said that nothing was more important to her early development as a writer than the award and Jaffe's support and generosity. She gave me space and time just when I needed it to delve deeply into my poetry allowing me not to work three jobs in Boston simultaneously just to barely make rent. This is sad news indeed. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world and finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, long live the Queen King. After directing television and documentaries, celebrated actor Regina King has made her feature film directorial debut, and what a debut it is. One Night in Miami is writer Kemp Powers' adaptation of his award-winning play, a fictional account of a real-life 1964 meeting between, get this, Sam Cooke, Jim Brown, Muhammad Ali, and Malcolm X. It's the evening after Ali beats Sonny Liston to become the heavyweight champ, when Brown is starting his acting career, and when Malcolm X is planning his Hajj to Mecca and his departure from the Nation of Islam. And if all that means nothing to you, then this movie may not be your jam. Zone out for the next minute and a half. Oh, and by the way, black movies matter. This film sees King not only as a director who can work with actors, but also as a director who benefits from her sensibilities as an actor. First, she trusted Powers and his script. As such, the heart of the film is built from three long scenes in one location each, with pretty much just the four principles. That means it's acting time. No effects, no quick moments, or action sequences, nowhere to run to, nowhere to hide. You just have to be right with your characters, and what characters they are. I was surprised at just how accessible these giants were. Eli Gorey, my man Aldous Hodge, Kingsley ben and Leslie Odom Jr., who has snagged two Oscar nominations from this flick, gently stepped these figures down from their pedestals without sacrificing their greatness. And though I was thrown at first, I grew to appreciate peeking into a private space where these men could both hold themselves up and hold each other to account as their greater civic stakes entwined with their personal ones. That accessibility is all due to King, who challenged her actors to find the vulnerability in these now near-mythic figures. Says King, One Night in Miami is quote, a quiet film, but it's loud as far as the subject matter. And in her hands, that combination proves to be moving and powerful. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube.
This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Burley McCoy. Mercury pollution from power plants and mining operations can end up in our air and water, but it's tricky to predict just how much of that environmental mercury will make its way into our food and our bodies. We were working on developing a a bioindicator, a biosentinel that could inform us of the levels of mercury contamination across the U.S. Ecologist Colin Eagle Smith of the United States Geological Survey. He and his colleagues came up with a practical way to determine the scope of mercury contamination in an ecosystem by measuring mercury levels in a single species. Their bioindicator? Juvenile dragonflies, or larvae. Dragonfly larvae stay underwater, don't move much, are easy to collect, and live long enough to accumulate significant amounts of mercury. If you have enough locations sampled with dragonflies, you can develop an index of of the relative amount of mercury in the biological community. The team measured mercury concentrations in thousands of dragonfly larvae collected from waterways in 100 national parks during a 10-year period. And to amass the large sample number, they recruited volunteers through the Dragonfly Mercury Project. The volunteers used dip nets to collect dragonfly larvae from their aquatic abodes. National park staff then sent the larvae to laboratories for processing. For comparison, the researchers also measured mercury concentrations in other aquatic organisms. Using the relationships between dragonfly concentrations and fish concentrations, we were able to develop what we call an impairment index. That index allowed the researchers to make health risk predictions at each sample site. About 12% of the locations posed what we considered to be high or severe risk of health impairment to fish, wildlife, or humans if they consumed organisms from those locations. Um, You can begin to build models that are predictive of of how much mercury might be in, in a system based on the landscape characteristics and the, and the water chemistry, and then apply that model to, to locations where you haven't sampled dragonflies. And that can inform future management actions, either to address the factors that are promoting ethylmercury production or simply to inform uh, agencies that may want to evaluate whether or not fish consumption advisories are warranted. The study is in the Journal of Environmental Science and Technology, If you'd like to get involved in the Dragonfly Mercury Project or to see a map of mercury concentrations across the U.S., search for the Dragonfly Mercury Project at nps.gov. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Burley McCoy. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome to A Cup of Health with CDC, a weekly feature of the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. I'm your host, Dr. Kathleen Dooling. Occasional aches and pains are an expected part of life, but for many people, pain is a constant companion. Dr. Chad Helmick is with CDC's National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. He's joining us today to discuss ways to manage chronic pain. Welcome to the show, Chad. Thank you. Chad, how many people in the U.S. suffer from chronic pain? In 2016, 50 million adults had chronic pain, which is pain on most or every day in the past six months. More interesting, though, is that 20 million people have high-impact chronic pain, which is chronic pain that also limits their work or life activities on most or every day in the past six months. This is a problem because chronic pain is associated not only with symptoms, but with anxiety and depression, reduced quality of life, and the risk of opioid problems. What are the most common causes of chronic pain? The most common causes generally relate to bones and joints, like low back pain and arthritis, but there are many other causes, headaches, sickle cell disease, fibromyalgia, surgery and injuries, and many, many others. Is chronic pain more common in any particular group of people? Yes, it's, uh, it occurs at all ages, but it's more common in um, older middle-aged adults and in the oldest old, 85 and older. It's also more common in women, poor people, and those who live in rural areas. How is chronic pain treated? Well, the first thing to do is to get a diagnosis, which can help guide treatment. But the thinking about chronic pain now is that it becomes a chronic disease by itself, regardless of the cause, and that can cause significant problems. 
The real goal in management is to have a manageable level of pain, not to get rid of all pain. There are several steps that can be taken, and these are sometimes difficult to do because of barriers to access. But it makes sense to do the simplest and safest things first. And these are non-drug steps, things like physical activity. Walking is perfectly good to help reduce pain. Also, self-management education can give you some confidence in managing chronic pain when you're on your own. There's also physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychological therapy, better sleep, which usually means less alcohol, and seeing a chiropractor or getting biofeedback and massage. If that's not enough, non-opioid drugs like Tylenol or Motrin and Advil or Naproxen or Aleve can help. If those don't work, then it's time to consider something stronger. Sometimes that's opioids, but there's not great evidence that opioids are good for long-term pain in most people. Do you have any advice for people suffering from chronic pain? Well, it's important to work with a variety of providers who are working together to help you. Uh, the goal, again, is manageable pain so you can live a productive life. This can include physical therapy, and most people can walk, to treat any underlying depression or anxiety, and to avoid further injuries. Finally, the National Pain Strategy is laying out a strategic roadmap to improve pain management system in this country. Where can listeners get more information about managing chronic pain? Listeners can go to the NIH website, nih.gov, and type in National Pain Strategy. Thanks, Chad. I've been talking today with Dr. Chad Helmick about ways to manage chronic pain. If you're experiencing daily pain, talk with your healthcare provider to ensure you have the correct diagnosis and know how to manage your condition. Until next time, be well. This is Dr. Kathleen Dooling for A Cup of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. I'm probably okay. I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay. I just popped some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzzed driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping Progressive Radio at full power. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1989. That was the day the Exxon Valdez oil tanker spilled nearly 11 million gallons of oil in Prince William Sound off the coast of Alaska. The ship ran aground and collided with Bly's Reef. Most people remember the captain was held primarily responsible for the spill. By his own admission, he had passed out after a night of heavy drinking. But a number of factors also contributed to the environmental disaster. The National Transportation Safety Board issued its final report over a year later. In it, the board concluded that fatigue, reduced crews, and problems with regulations and procedures regarding Exxon's drug and alcohol program all contributed to the spill. Union officials reported great concern regarding chronic fatigue of its members on merchant ships, reduced crews due to greater automation, and reduced scheduled ship maintenance. Crew members on the Exxon Valdez routinely worked 20 hours or more a day during routine cargo handling operations. The NTSB also concluded that vessel traffic service under the U.S. Coast Guard failed to properly track the Exxon Valdez. They had the ability to select a higher radar scale, but didn't. The Coast Guard suffered from reduced crews burdened with increased job duties as well. They also found that remote communication sites were inoperable on the night of the spill. The equipment was old, deteriorating from harsh weather conditions. Requested funding for new equipment had not been forthcoming. The Alieska Pipeline Company, for its part, failed to have an oil spill barge loaded and ready to go. Major cleanup efforts were conducted during the spring and summer months through 1992. But marine life and the environments were devastated. 
Long-term efforts at monitoring and cleanup continue today. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at west coast cookbook and speakeasy smothered benedict wednesdays we always begin whether from around the world along the banks of the rogue river in the rogue river valley of southern oregon on the west coast of the continental united states of america where it is currently 34 degrees fahrenheit expecting only a high in the mid 50s low to mid 50s A mix of clouds and sun this morning, followed by mostly cloudy skies and a few showers in the afternoon. Winds out of the north-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And then rain showers this evening, mixing with snow showers overnight. With lows in the low 30s, winds continuing out of the west-northwest at 5 to 10. And it looks like, in terms of just water falling from the sky in liquid form, could get something less than a quarter inch. Then tomorrow, we're expecting highs in the mid to upper 40s, cloudy with rain and snow showers, diminishing in the morning, a few breaks in the clouds in the afternoon, winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County, in the southern part of Oregon, have been revised and have been updated from the weekend totals. We are now just a stitch under 9,000 at 8,000. 8,987. Confirmed deceased remains at 120. Pollen is still rated as none here at the mothership in Rogue River proper, but I don't believe it. The air quality index is good at 23 parts per million, and the daytime UV index remains moderate at 5. Barometric pressure is... Oh, holding steady at 30.27 inches, visibility is up to 10 miles, and relative humidity is at 99%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 55 and cloudy. Rome is 60 degrees. Oh, I'm sorry. Paris is 65 degrees and sunny. Rome is 60 and sunny. Kiev is 45, 42 and fair. What's going on here? Kabul is 53 and partly cloudy. Hong Kong is 67 degrees and clear. Tokyo is 58 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 70 and clear. San Francisco, California is 51 degrees and sunny. And New York, New York is 50 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd, crowdsources from around the world. Michael Martina and Nicola Groom of Reuters brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Two U.S. senators have asked the leading solar energy gr- lobbying group to clarify U.S. dependence on solar products linked to forced labor in China's Zhangjing, part of a push in Congress to address what Western countries say are rights abuses by Beijing. Republican Marco Rubio hmm, and Democrat Jeff Merkley sent a letter asking the Solar Energy Institute's Association, otherwise known as SIA, to detail measures it or member companies have taken to ensure that solar products sourced from Xinjiang, including polysilicon, are not made using forced labor. 
The senators ask CF for information on the extent to which the U.S. solar supply chain is currently dependent on polysilicone and solar ingot wafers made in Zhengzhen, according to a letter, a copy of the letter seen by Reuters. Polysilicon is a key raw material used to produce solar panels that generate electricity from sunlight. In the letter, the senator said that reliance on China-based supply chain fails to protect consumers from inadvertently contributing to human rights abuses abroad. Dan Wooden, CIA's vice president of public affairs, said the group shared the senator's concerns. We have called on American solar companies to completely leave the Zhangjing region by June and are working hard to develop a supply chain traceability protocol that can be used as a compliance tool to ensure the products they use are free of forced labor. Rubio and Mar- and Merkley partnered earlier this year to re-indu- reintroduce legislation that would ban all products from the region without specific approvals. While such legislation has had strong bipartisan support, Congressional aides say it has been the target of lobbying by firms with supply chain links to Zhang Jing. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux. Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, restez toujours fidèle, c'est tout, c'est tout. Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer, mes automnes quand les feuilles tombent partout. Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne. Jim Gomez of the AP brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The Philippine Supreme Court condemned the alarming number of killings and threats against lawyers and judges. One legal group has said these attacks are considerably higher under President Rodrigo Duterte compared to the past 50 years under six former presidents combined. The 15-member high court asked lower courts, law enforcement agencies, and lawyers and judges groups to provide information about such attacks in the last 10 years in order for the court to take preemptive steps. The attacks, it said, endanger the rule of law in an Asian bastion of democracy. To threaten our judges and our lawyers is no less than an assault on the judiciary. To assault the judiciary is to shake the very bedrock on which the rule of law stands. This cannot be allowed in a civilized society like ours, the high court said, in a rare, strongly worded censure of the attacks. The court said it would not tolerate such attacks that only perverse justice, defeat the rule of law, undermine the most basic of constitutional principles, and speculate on the worth of human lives. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio will broadcast on. And we're going to meet up tomorrow for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de manche à d'un hiver. Sous la 
Don't leave it. 